Today I'm going to be talking about uh, how I adapted the group project and uh, software training that I include in my uh, fourth year technical elective Civ 550. And this is a water resources engineering uh, course. <laughs> Um, so this course has always had a very significant project. It's not um, it's not a traditional design project, but it does do a lot of very realistic water resource engineering work. Um, and in the past, we have had sort of two parts to this project. In the first half of the semester, the students co complete what's called a, a watershed assessment. So this involves a lot of uh, research work, you know, gathering information about a watershed uh, in Ontario, um, the community, the hydrology, the climate, the landforms. Um, and this has used a lot of ArcGIS. And so they, we learn how to find data that's publicly available and then, you know, make the maps and the stuff that we're going to need if we wanted to then do hydrologic modeling. Um, we've also then predicted or, or estimated what we think flood flows are going to be for different likelihoods. And in the past, this has been done through sort of first principles you know, using the material that they learn in their second year related to hydrology um, to then, you know, and all this information, land based information that they had. Um, and there's been some really fantastic student output from this. And you can see some examples here of what, you know, their watershed assessments sort of final projects can look like. Uh, but moving this online, I had a lot of concerns. The first one was the use of ArcGIS for sure uh, and the needs it was going to be, as well as the just the variety of access of information and um, and then even just the different techniques you can use to come to the, the estimates for these flood systems. The second half of the course, we then do a sort of a part two in our project where once we have a prediction of what we think a flood event will look like in terms of what the flow will be, they then take a small section of the river in their watershed and build a hydraulic model. So they build a river model so that they can map uh, uh, where they can map the extent of the flooding. Um, sorry about that, guys. I have no idea. Hopefully that's not too loud. Um, and you can see here sort of like this is kind of an example output where you can just look at the profile of the river as well as say a, a bridge that that's going to be uh, following. So the challenges of going remote, um, I was, you know, really unsure. Uh, first of all, what the students home access to computing power was going to be. Um, there's, you know, uh, opportunities for informal questions and answers. We would normally almost open every lecture with kind of a, hey, what, where are you in your project? Um, and I wasn't sure how we were going to do that, uh, you know, naturally in an online environment. And then, of course, you know, completely unsure what the time commitments and workloads are uh, while we were, were working remotely. Uh, and so I, I did a fair bit of completely refamping this project so that we could deliver it online, as well as did a lot of preparation to help the students, you know, think about how to set themselves up to study remotely. So we started the semester then by, you know, actually just discussing how to get ready to work remotely. Um, we, I spent like a 15 minute, like a 20 minute lecture just on, you know, best practices for setting up their home offices. So this included giving examples from uh, the teaching assistants who had been working remotely all summer as graduate classes. And then also a, you know, more lengthy discussion about how to balance working in a confined living space. You know, many of the students that we have are working from a bedroom and that is their only private study space 
And of course, this can lead to a whole lot of like mental health issues where you're you don't have that separation of states. So we actually talked about, you know, best practices about how you could go about to creating separate spaces, even if your only only workspace is a bedroom. And again, gave some examples of, you know, me living in, in small spaces of, of how that might be achieved. And then we shifted to talking about how we were going to do a group project remote. Um, and so this started with me getting information from the students to figure out where they were, what their availability is, um, if they had friends in the class, if they did not have friends in the class that they wanted to work with. So groups were uh, created by myself with information. So where students had a partner or had a, a person they were interested in working with um, that was then allowed um, and then students who didn't since they wouldn't have the in-class options to sort of chat to someone uh, we you know facilitated matching students then we also had a lecture about working remotely um, i brought in one of my the tas who's been doing this as a part of her her research for a whole time to actually go through you know again, best practices for making sure that you were going to be productive. Um, so we talked about the importance of creating rules and norms um, for how you're going to interact, you know, setting a schedule, deciding, or even just having a conversation of how you wanted to structure your group meetings, uh, the importance of note taking uh, and assigning, you know, sort of specific actions and milestones. And of course, the need for communication and, and having different ways of communicating with your groups. We talked to that um, in especially the importance of using your webcam for building a relationship um, with your teammates, um, the importance of focusing just on the task at hand and not, you know, also watching TV or doing something else. Um, and then even discussing about the, the idea that you might want to have you know, just social times integrated or where you can actually, you know, get to know each other in a more meaningful way. Um, and then finally, we gave them a lot of advice on terms of how to, uh, you know, how to communicate. Um, and, uh, you know, some of the students took us up on some of these recommendations, others found their own ways to, to communicate. After this, then, um, we, I laid out the expectations for the project and I delivered this, um, you know, first by creating asynchronous kind of little mini snippets, um, sort of giving them a big overview and then also um, in Quarkus sort of outlines of like here is the background about why flood mapping is important and these are the steps that we are going to do over the semester. For communication, we laid out things like a checklist that they could use to make sure that their reports, you know, had everything that was expected. And then for each phase of the group project, we had a dedicated question and answer. Um, I haven't used Pizzazz um, or Piazza. Um, I've just been using Quirkus and I was amazed actually at how effective this was. Um, in terms of communicating and, and making sure that all the class had access to the same information. This actually ended up like quite closely replicating some of that like informal discovery where you have a group, you know, a student in a computer lab next to you who is chatting and you overhear a conversation and you realize you're making the same mistake. Um, students sort of reported that they would discover things they needed to fix just by reading through the, the discussion feeds. Um, in terms of making sure the group dynamics were manageable, we set out the expectation that everyone needed to contribute to the technical work. And then for software that was being covered, we we included it or I included it in the midterms, the individual assessments as well, so that this uh, eliminated the chance where there's just one student that does all the software learning and two students that just you know, focus on the, the soft aspects of the project. And then lastly, students had to report their contributions. As we broke up the project into phases, if the student was not contributing to technical work, there was always an opportunity to say, hey, in the next submission, we'd like to see 
you know, Joanne leading the modeling part so that there was there was a chance to raise issues if we noticed them early in the semester. Now, trying to teach software remotely. Um, I am by no means an expert on this. Um, and in engineering, it's extra tricky because we're applying a modeling science. We're, the students in the class, we're not hydrologists. You know, we're not just interested in the theory. We want to just use this tool so that we can look at engineering problems. Um, and it's uh, very, very tricky. Um, my approach was to, as I've said, to first separate it so that there were individual but sort of sequential deliverables. Um, be very flexible, like it extremely flexible on due dates and actually um, and I was very clear that I laid out that the project itself would be reevaluated and we ended up actually substantially changing some of the later deliverables both in terms of like uh, weighting or content uh, to accommodate or, or basically you know react to the workload requirements that the students were reporting back to us. So what we did for for software, um, I changed up what we covered. Well, first of all, we dropped ArcGIS because I really was not confident in our ability for students to have the computing power at home for that. And we moved instead to R, uh, which is you know an open source software uh, run can be used on on Macs or PCs. Um, I worked with my department to purchase proprietary software, HIMO. Um, main driver for this was to, again to you know give the students something a unique experience and and generally i would only use freeware or openware and so i thought it would be nice to go the extra mile and actually get proprietary software that's used by consultants um for for the year and then we kept uh heck uh, but also but uh which is the river modeling software that we use but i eliminated the aspects that used to integrate with arcgis so my perspective is to learn software, you you have to just work with it. It is not a skill that you can learn, you know, by you have to learn by doing. Um, and so how do we do this um, on in the online environment? Um, having a project is one, but you also just need to encourage students to invest time playing with the program, trying to do stuff and, and learning um, uh, by doing. So the strategies that I did was, first of all, cre I created short demonstration videos. I built my R videos over the summer um, where, you know, using uh, 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 the screen capture, Snagit, um, you know, went through how to do the steps that they were going to do in their projects. And during the semester then I had my teaching assistants developing the same sort of style of uh, videos for Hymo and Hecaras, which were that was the order that the software was covered. Um, and then I also uh, used software game classes and um, I, I this I, I like this. This was uh, partly successful. Uh, what we did was they had this lecture sort of like a flipped classroom after they had been, um, you know, had reviewed the, the demo videos and they were put into breakout rooms and given a, a task to do something, you know, a question about, you know, finding something in R or writing a small script of code. And it was a competition for the group that could, you know, successfully do the most um, over the um, over the hour. And so when they had, you know, had done it, they would put up their hand and myself or a TA would pop in. If they had, you know, figured it out, then they were given another one and they kept going and we had little tallies going, letting students know which team was in the lead. Um, the prize, um, because, you know, it's not like we're in person, I could give out candy bars or uh, pencils or something like this. The prize was then um, a, the, the winning team got to pick a story from my youth. <laughs> so I gave, you know, three, you know, misleading titles that sounded like I had a crazy, excited, wild, you know, uh, childhood and they got they got to pick. They ended up wanting to hear about my um, my fourth year Kipling pranks, which is a tradition that McMaster engineers have. Um, 
so uh, yeah, this was, this was uh, surprisingly fun. Um, we also used a lot of meeting and offering to have additional meetings um, for, for with groups as they were experiencing challenges and then checking in and asking them a lot. We used, I used surveys a lot throughout the semester and this was very, very helpful for realizing when, you know, it just was not going to be achievable and how, how we could scale things back. And in fact, some of the solutions to this work, these work log problems, you know, leaving open ended questions for the students gave me great, great suggestions of how we could keep the essence of the project of what we were trying to achieve while also eliminating the stuff that they were finding was taking a lot, a lot of time. So I'm just going to show you a couple of um, project outcomes because I think all things considered it, it turned out really well. Um, so here you can see this is um, some of the project write ups that the students did uh, earlier in the semester. I kept the page counts really small, really, really short, trying to reduce the, the writing um, writing time because I wanted the focus to be on the modeling and the like the software learning. Um, so here you can see, uh, you know, students that uh, this one was the uh, the frequency analysis that we were doing in R um, uh, for the first part of the project. And, you know, they're reporting their assumptions and their fitted populations and they've gotten little math from a web browser. And um, yeah, it's uh, yeah, it's an excellent example. And then here's a sort of an example of their hydrologic model uh, write up. And so um, we looked at predicting flood flows using two techniques that are that are often used. The frequency analysis, the statistical uh, approach is used when you have river data and then hydraulic modeling where you actually build a model of sub watersheds and then, you know, simulate or the, the transformation of rainfall to runoff um, that's you know done when you don't have uh, river data and so you can see it's the same watershed now they have like little subsections they enter in you know they have all the information about how the water is going to move through that system and get to the ultimate outlet um, I will also show now uh, a river model example uh, so we still need topographic data I wasn't going to, uh, you know, deal with ArcGIS or try and get them going with the map and data library. It was going to be too much. So we we dealt with this by just giving them the the topographic data file instead of where we would normally ask them to find it themselves. Uh, and then from that, they can generate the river cross sections. Um, so you can see here, you know, the river cross sections um, and then uh, they would use the flows. This one isn't in here. They would use the flows from their 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 earlier work, the flood values that they had calculated in uh, parts two and three to simulate the actual flooding in the river. Let me put in a. So uh, yeah, it worked out really well um all things all things considered and and uh um i think one of the things that why the students respond to this project is that it is legitimate water resource engineering work uh this is real work that we do obviously we're making a lot of assumptions and and you know uh, uh jumps in terms of data that we have available but the process itself of gathering information about your watershed deciding can you do you know statistical analysis or do you need to do hydrologic modeling and then you know modeling that river water to figure out how far the flood's going to extend is is something that is done you know a, a, a lot so i'm just going to finish with sort of some reflections of, of what i would do differently and uh whether i would keep it again um would I do it again? I think definitely, definitely yes. I, I think the pivot to online and making me to 100% drop any sort of hard paper, uh, moving the project presentation fully online and on the web system or the course 
system has actually led to cleaner and, and more efficient communication. So I'm going to be reusing this material for sure. But then also the demonstration uh, videos. I've really actually struggled with teaching software in person um, at U of T. We don't, our, our classrooms are not, at least in engineering, are not actually always set up ideally to teach software. You know, even in some of our, our, our computer labs, even if you book them, there's no place to demonstrate and project what you're doing on your, your screen, um, or you may not have enough uh, desks for the students that you want, um, and, and everyone learns at different paces. So the videos, the demonstration videos are, are going to be so valuable for me in terms of showing how you do this, and then students can come back and refer to it. Um, for myself, when I was learning this stuff, I would have like textbooks of print screen you know, step by steps that I saved from being a grad student for like 10 years till it became that like inherent to me. Um, and, I, and I just feel like, oh, wow, having this as video content is going to be a huge asset. Um, I, I definitely realized that we I need to spend more time on less time on written submissions and with us now in a situation where it was remote and they're just handing in the models. There is actually an opportunity for me to not include a write up for some of the parts, just reproducing the model itself, and then that can be evaluated um, uh, by what was in there or or what was what was uh, whether it was functioning or not functioning. Uh, I think also, and I, from the students, I think that they would prefer to see more presentations or even just oral communication of their results. It's less time in terms of writing, um, and it's something that they feel they actually want more practice on. Um, so I think we'll we'll move towards that. Some of the traps that I that I observed, even with the like best practices that I encouraged, was for the for the students um, the tendency to implement a divide and conquer approach to the project, even with you know some of the software being included in the assessments. It was quite obvious that at some points, you know, students were separating out the work and not having that sort of peer review discussion contemplation about why certain decisions are being made or why certain parts of their model were being set up that way. Um, and uh, that lack of communication then often would then have like reverberating effects. Um, the other issue is that this project really requires students with a high level of engagement. It's a huge amount of work. Um, the students always say that, but they always pair it with the fact that like it's really, really valuable work. And I often will then hear students saying like I, you know, when I had interviews, then I described this project and it, you know, it's all these things that would that lend very well to the next stage of their career. Um, but I don't think this type of stuff would be as effective at some of the lower levels where students aren't in the course by choice, at least in engineering. For me, in terms of teaching traps, I think my biggest one is the issue of depth versus breadth. Um, you know, I, a lot of the feedback about the students is that they feel like we didn't get to really understand things because we were always moving on to the next part. Um, I think they're, it's 100% legitimate uh, criticism um, and certainly something that I always struggle with like maybe we shouldn't do the whole process maybe we should only do the first path um, along with that is this fact that you know the, the whole project it's only at the end of the semester that you see the entire picture and you understand why we did all these things all semester long and in many ways it's very different to the way most of engineering is taught which is linear and and a pyramid um, and water resources is very much more like a mosaic. Um, it's, it's circular, it's holistic, it's, it's not the same structure. Um, and uh, it, it is, I still struggle with how to, to communicate and teach you know, the material effectively. So uh, that brings us to the end. Thank you. Oh. <laughs> uh, I'm going to turn off my, square, my share so that I can see people in. Um, um, hopefully, I'd be happy to take some questions. I was just going to let you know there's a couple questions in the chat, but I'm sure you can see them if you stop sharing okay, them. Okay, perfect. Let me uh, look at the chat. 
Okay, uh, yeah, so Jonathan, in terms of this, uh, gr the, the size of the class, so the course ranges um, between 15 to 30 students year over year. This year was actually high. It was like in the 30, um, 30s, which was, which was surprising. Um, and the groups I, uh, I have settled on generally a groups of three um, or a little bit more depending. There will often be graduate students as well. So sometimes maybe the, then the, they might end up with a couple of fours or twos, uh, depending on, on where they, they fall. Yeah, um, so Simon, uh, I haven't, I got to learn Jupiter. <laughs> That's a great, a great question. Um, yeah, I feel, I, I think that there's definitely for for their code with the R, for example, or Simone, um, I was just having them send in the R code. Uh, but uh, yeah, I've I've realized there are a I got to learn Python and two I got to learn Jupiter. These are two things that I've realized over the last couple of years that I I've missed. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, I think there are definitely other things that we can continue this like remote delivery that would make sense. Uh, and I'm happy to share, uh, uh, yeah, slides for sure. Awesome. Thank you so much, everybody, for the questions, and thank you, for Professor Drake, for your presentation. Um, we have a break oh, right now. Hands. Um, if, a couple of hands, actually. Oh. I think some people okay. might be Sorry, wanting to ask questions. Uh, I think, Jonathan? Go ahead. Sure, yeah, I was curious about the discussion boards and how you set that up, like whether you had to seed anything like this, this idea of students learning from each other in a computer lab. I think that's like fantastic and I was I, I didn't really try to get it, so I'm, I'm but I'm very curious to hear about it. Yeah, so what I did is for each part, I had a discussion board that was just on that part because otherwise, especially in Corcus, it gets too long. So, you know, and there it was about three weeks that we were on each part. And the other thing that I started doing, and I'm going to, I'm never going back. When students had questions, if they sent it to me in an email, I stopped answering them. And I said, that's a great question. Put it on the Q&A board. Uh, I will respond to it there. Um, yeah, I haven't used Piazza, and I know that's the other one that's really popular. I, I checked it out this semester, and it just looked more fancy than it needed to be. Um, and, uh, and uh, yeah, especially with, for most of software, especially like the the R, you know, students would post their code um, or even stream, uh, screen uh, shots. Um, some of the the HECRAS stuff got it wasn't perfect, and you know, and I think I would have also like uh, virtual office hours where then I would just be like, hey, it's like show me it because you know in the real life that's what I would end up doing during office hours. I would just go go into the computer lab for an hour and they would just swarm and you walk around and you answer the questions um so but yeah it was actually shocking at how useful it was um and students then started just checking it out routinely and then started like also as i said saying oh yeah we are doing the same thing we got to fix that um yeah sebastian i see you have a hand up too yeah i was just wondering I know in, in our program, they, they don't get a ton of exposure to coding, maybe a, a bit of MATLAB, a bit of Python. So I'm just wondering, like, how are the students react to the integration of R in your course? Were they excited? Could they see the value of what they were learning? Or were they just like, oh, something new I'll have to learn that I'll never use again? <laughs> I, I certainly had some students asking, could we please use Python? And I was like, I'm sorry, I don't know how to do any of this in Python. I learned R. <laughs> um, um, but I was like, I'm sure you, if you learn one, you'll learn the other. Um, but um, the other thing I did was, you know, as I said, like I'm not teaching R. We're just using R to do the flood frequency analysis. And so there are a ton of packages specifically for flood frequency analysis and packages that have been made like for Canadian using Canadian data sets too. So um, it was very like I laid out like this process step by step by step of what they needed to do uh, in, and included then the code. So they had videos and then they had code and you could see the students that were weaker just copy pasted the code and tried to, you know, just, you know, whatever. And then the students that were, you know, more developed 
uh, got a lot further and, and you could really see at the end like how they they sort of looked at these different things. But um, yeah, it was it, it, it was received, I think, really well. And I think some of the students, maybe that might be even been why I retained more students is because we started with this and they're like, oh, code, like this is fun. This isn't the like hippie granola environmental class I was expecting. <laughs> um, so, yeah. OK, I think I think uh, that's it, though. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, I'm going to stop the recording. We have a short break now until session three, which starts at 1.30. Yeah, thank you so much, everybody. <laughs>